Hello and welcome everybody, my name is Elliot and in this physics mini lesson, I'm going to teach you about the first thing you would learn in a class on string theory, except that I'm going to do my best to make it as accessible as possible for beginners. String theory has a reputation for being a very challenging subject, and when you get deep into the details it is. But the basic idea is very natural, and it's a straightforward generalization of what you've been learning about if you've watched my last few videos about the principle of least action for a particle in Einstein's theory of relativity. I'll link those down in the description if you want to get caught up to speed. We've been learning that the action for a particle in Einstein's theory has a very simple and geometric interpretation. As the particle travels around through space-time, it traces out a curve that's called its world line. Then the action for the particle is just equal, up to some factors, to the length of the world line. The principle of least action then says that the particle is going to choose the shortest path that it can in traveling between two events in space-time. String theory replaces the fundamental role of the particle with a tiny loop of string. Whereas the particle traces out a one-dimensional curve as it moves through space-time, the string will trace out a two-dimensional surface. We call the path that the particle traces out its world line. For the string, we call the two-dimensional surface that it traces out the world sheet. Picture something like the surface of a bubble as you wave a bubble wand around through the air. The rim of the wand in this analogy is the string, and the bubble that's trailed out behind it as you wave the wand around is the world sheet. Now we want to write down a principle of least action for the string. If the natural action for a particle was equal to the length of its world line, then the obvious generalization for a string is just the area of its world sheet. So in this video, I'm going to show you how we can express the action for a string as the area of the world sheet that it traces out in space-time. And along the way, we'll learn some very cool math about the geometry of surfaces. As far as prerequisites go, you'll really just need to know some calculus in order to be able to follow along with me, as well as to remember the key ideas from the last couple of videos that I've shared with you about the principle of least action. So I hope this will be fun. As usual, you can get the notes that go along with this video for free at the link down in the description. And I hope that you'll also leave me a comment after you've watched, either with questions or suggestions for topics that you'd like me to cover in the future. I'd really love to know what kinds of things you're interested in learning about in future videos. All right, let's dive in. First of all, let's forget about string theory and Minkowski space-time and all that, and just figure out the little bit of math that we need in order to compute the area of a surface. So picture that bubble wand again. As you wave it around through the air, the bubble that trails behind it is a 2D surface embedded inside of 3D space. Let's write the coordinates of space as x vector with components x, y, and z. Now, if we had had a line in space instead of a surface, we would have described it by giving a curve x as a function of lambda, where lambda is some parameter along the curve. This function tells you how each point lambda in parameter space gets mapped to a point x of lambda in 3D space. Now, when we graduate to our 2D surface instead of a curve, we need another parameter. Let's call it sigma. Then, we specify the surface by a function x of sigma and lambda. Our wand here is a closed loop, so let's make the sigma direction a circle. Then our parameter space is a cylinder, and our function tells us how each point sigma lambda in the parameter space gets mapped to a point in 3D space. And that's how we describe the shape of our surface. So the question we need to answer is, if someone hands us a surface by writing down its function, x of sigma lambda, how do we compute its area? Well, let's think about a little rectangular area of the parameter space. A little rectangle of width d sigma and of height d lambda. After the map to 3D space, that little rectangle is going to turn into some tiny parallelogram on our 2D surface. If we can write down the little bit of area dA of that tiny parallelogram, then by adding up all those little areas, we'll be able to compute the total area of our surface. So we have this little parallelogram. One corner is at x of sigma lambda, and the one next to it is at x of sigma plus d sigma and lambda. So we can draw a vector along the bottom edge of our parallelogram, given by x of sigma plus d sigma lambda minus x evaluated at sigma lambda. That looks familiar. It's basically the derivative of x in the direction of sigma. In particular, if I divide that by d sigma, this is literally the derivative of x with respect to sigma. I'm using curly d's here because these are partial derivatives. 
If you haven't seen them before in your math classes, don't worry too much about it. They're just like regular old derivatives, except that our function x depends on more than one variable. So we use this partial symbol to indicate that we're only looking at the rate of change with respect to one of them. So we can multiply this d sigma to the other side, and then that tells us this vector pointing along one side of our parallelogram is dx by d sigma times d sigma. Likewise, we can draw a vector along the other side, and that'll just be d lambda times dx by d lambda. Now we just have a little geometry problem to figure out the area of our parallelogram. So let's make a little digression to review how you compute the area of a parallelogram that's spanned by two vectors. So here are two vectors, a and b. If we want to find the area of this parallelogram, we take the length of one of the sides, a say, and then we need to multiply by the altitude. If we let theta be the angle between the two vectors, then the altitude is b times the sine of theta. And so the area is the length of a times the length of b times the sine of theta. Now I want to write that a little bit more conveniently. Let me first of all square this equation. Then I can use the fact that sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared to rewrite it as the length of a squared times the length of b squared minus the length of a, the length of b, times cosine theta, all that squared. The reason I did that is because now the thing in parentheses is just the dot product of a and b. So we get a nice formula for the area of a parallelogram spanned by two vectors. It's the length of a squared times the length of b squared minus a dot b squared, and I take the square root of all that. Now back on our surface, we had a little parallelogram where a was d sigma times dx by d sigma, and b was d lambda times dx by d lambda. So using our formula, the little piece of area of our parallelogram is d sigma times dx by d sigma, the length of that vector squared, d lambda times dx by d lambda, that magnitude squared, minus d sigma dx by d sigma dot d lambda dx by d lambda. And then I take that quantity squared, and I take the square root of the whole thing. Now that looks like a little bit of a mess, but we can simplify it a lot. First of all, notice that each term has a factor of d sigma squared and d lambda squared. So let's pull those outside the square root. Then we've got d sigma d lambda times the square root of all the rest. Now that still looks a little bit complicated, but there's a way to write it much more compactly. Let's define a 2 by 2 matrix that we'll call H. In the top left, we've got dx by d sigma, length squared. Likewise, in the bottom right, we'll put dx by d lambda, magnitude squared. And then in the off diagonal entries, let's put dx by d sigma dot dx by d lambda. And the same thing in the bottom left corner. The reason for defining this matrix is that the thing that's inside the square root here is nothing but the determinant of h. So we can write our formula for the area much more compactly as d sigma times d lambda times the square root of the determinant of h. And then we can get the total area of the whole surface by integrating over sigma and lambda. Areas and volumes and so on can always be written like this. h isn't some random matrix. It's the metric on the surface just like the metrics a to mu nu and g mu nu that we encountered in the previous videos about special relativity and general relativity. Metrics tell us how to measure distances in a given space, so they naturally also tell us how to measure areas. So that was the math that we needed to cover in order to learn how to compute the area of a surface. So now let's get back to the physics. We were thinking here of a bubble getting traced out in 3D space as you wave the wand around. Now it's a short step to go to the world sheet of a little loop of string that's getting traced out as it evolves through space-time. And we only need to make a couple of modifications to write down the area of the world sheet. First of all, instead of this three-component vector x, which gave us coordinates in 3D space, we need to replace it with the four-component vector x mu that gives us coordinates on space-time, just like we used in the last lesson on relativity. Likewise, we need to replace the familiar Pythagorean notion of distance in regular space with the Minkowski metric in space-time, ds squared equals a to mu nu times dx mu dx nu. Where again, remember it's always implied here that I'm summing over these repeated indices. So mu and nu are getting summed from 0 to 3. 
We could also pick a curve metric gmu to describe a string in curve space time. But let's stick to flat space time here to keep things simple. Now, this new metric affects all the places where we computed magnitudes and dot products of vectors. So we need to update our matrix H. In the top left corner here, that gets replaced by eta mu nu, dx mu by d sigma, dx nu by d sigma. That's just the length of the vector dx by d sigma computed with the Minkowski metric. Likewise, in the bottom right corner, we've got eta mu nu, dx mu by d lambda, dx nu by d lambda. And finally, in the off diagonal spots, we've got eta mu nu, dx mu by d sigma, dx nu by d lambda. That's the dot product of dx by d sigma with dx by d lambda. Now there's one last thing. Just like when we wrote down the length of a particle's world line, by integrating over minus ds squared, square root, we had to flip the sign of ds squared before we took the square root, because it was negative. The same goes for the determinant of h in Minkowski spacetime. So we'll flip the sign of that determinant before we take the square root in Minkowski spacetime. And that's it. So here's our formula for the area of the world sheet that the string sweeps out as it moves through spacetime. And now we're finally ready to write down the action for our string. For our particle, the action was minus mc times the length of the world line. Remember that those constants had to be there to get the units right. Remember from way back when that we originally defined the action as the integral over time of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, at least in Newtonian mechanics. So the units are energy times time. Seconds times kilograms meters squared per second squared, or in other words, kilograms times meters squared per second. So in our formula for the action for the particle, we've got kilograms from the m, meters per second from c, times meters again from the length of the world line, which indeed gives us kilograms meters squared per second. Now we want to write down the analogous formula for the action for a string, which is proportional to the area of the world sheet. Again, there's going to be a constant out front that gets the units right. And I'm going to write it like this, minus t divided by c times the area. Where t is going to be some other constant, and we want to understand the interpretation of it. Well, let's see what the units are. This is an action, so we're supposed to get kilograms meters squared per second. And our formula gives us whatever the units of t are, times 1 over c, that's going to be in seconds per meter, times this area, that's in meters squared. So this constant t, therefore, is measured in kilograms meters per second squared, which you recognize is a force. That's because t is the tension in the string. And so the action is proportional to the tension times the area of the world sheet. So there we have it. This is the action for a relativistic string. The principle of least action then says that the string is going to evolve along the world sheet with extremal area, similar to how we talked about a particle picking the world line with the extremal length. You can derive the resulting equation of motion for the string in the usual way, by making a tiny variation of the surface and demanding that the action doesn't change to leading order. The solutions are called harmonic functions, which are very special and show up in a huge variety of contexts. So that's the beginning of string theory. It's called the Nambu Goto action for a relativistic string. And it's safe to say it's just the tip of the iceberg for string theory. But if you've stuck with me this far, you've already got a good head start on the subject. I hope these last few videos about the principle of least action have been interesting. And we haven't even gotten to the action principles for field theories, like the standard model of particle physics. But suffice it to say, the principle of least action is fundamental to the modern way that we think about physics. Again, you can get the notes that go along with this video for free at the link down in the description. And while you're down there, please hit the like button. And again, leave me a comment to tell me about what you'd like to learn about in future videos. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.